The Wiz antenna. Hmm. You know, if I was going to design an antenna for ham radio, I'm not sure I would call it Wiz. I'll give it a bit more sensible name, perhaps. But there again, there's a company in America that make computers. They call themselves Apple. Apparently, they're not doing too badly either. Well hello and welcome once again to the Waters and Stanton video channel. We're going to have a look today at something called the Whiz Whip, a self-contained antenna that covers 80 metres through to 2 metres. Quite a wide range, isn't it? Now, this antenna first started life as a miracle whip. It then became something called a wonder wand, although the wonder wand wasn't quite the same. But now it's known as the Whiz Whip. So first of all, let's take a look and see what's in the box, or rather in this case, what's in the packet. The package comprises the main control unit and a telescopic whip. Fully telescoped out, the whip measures 1.3 metres and is in 10 sections. Folded, it is 20 centimetres long and here you can see a BNC connector for the control unit. The control box is a small plastic enclosed item. You've got the BNC antenna socket uh, there on the top. And uh, on the bottom you've got a PL259 connector for your antenna socket. You turn it over, there's nothing on the back. It's uh, apart from a pair of screws. And then on the top you've got this control unit which it goes around and click stops. I took the back off to have a peek inside and uh, it reminds me of a back of a pocket watch actually. Um, there's nothing much to see apart from the mechanics but uh, anyway it's a bit of engineering there which is uh, quite interesting. This uh, unit is really for QRP work. It's rated at a maximum power of 10 watts. And to be honest things like this interest me because it's very easy to think oh this is a bit of a gimmick. Is it a whiz or is it a swizz? So I wanted to really have a, a look at it, but it's certainly not a Swiss. It's quite an interesting product, actually. The first thing I did was to put a meter across the input, because I expected to see a short circuit, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And sure enough, when I put a meter across the connection, the PL259 plug, there was a short circuit. The reason I say that is because this unit covers 80 metres through to 2 metres. Now, I think we probably would understand that on 2 metres you're just going to use basically the whip. But to cover a range from, say, one, from 80 metres to 10 metres with one knob is pushing it a bit. It certainly can't be an LC network. And the fact that it was a short circuit meant to see, say that it's not an LC network in there. In actual fact, what is in there, though I can't see it, but I've been doing a bit of research, and we'll come back to that as well in a minute, what is in there is a switched impedance uh, unit. Basically, it matches the impedance of the antenna. It doesn't tune the antenna as you would normally with a loading coil, a variable loading coil, and quite clearly you can't get a loading coil in there anyway. Um, no, it's it's switched impedance. So what it does, it matches the impedance of the antenna. And an antenna that length is going to have a very low impedance. But it's quite an interesting way that it does this. And one of the things that I noticed, which again confirms that it's a switched impedance, is that when you adjust the length of the antenna, it doesn't make too much difference to the apparent resonant frequency. If you adjust this unit to get the best VSWR, which typically is around about 1.5, maybe 2 to 1. If you adjust it for the best VSWR, and then you adjust the length of the whip, it makes very little difference. Now, if this was a traditional LC network or a loading coil, just a small adjustment on the antenna would make quite a difference to the VSWR, but on this unit it doesn't. Before I go into more detail about how I think this item works, let me just uh, show you a quick test I did when I first had the unit on 40 metres just to make sure that the antenna works. I set it up in my garden on 40 metres 
with uh, just the 1.3 meter whip. To get us roughly in the right ballpark, we adjust for maximum noise. If I touch the whip area and the signals go well down, then I know that the antenna is pretty well resonant. Let me show you basically the concepts that this uh, whiz is uh, probably um, uh, based on. There's, there's two possibilities. Uh, one possibility is that we have a coil there and then we have another coil there. Um, this goes to the antenna and this coil goes to the TX or receiver and there's coupling there and this point here is adjustable up and down the coil like that. So by adjusting that up and down you change the impedance match. The other way, which may be the way they've done it, I don't know, um, is to have just one coil and then use what is called an auto transformer. By the way, this here would be tied together there. Um, an auto transformer. So you've got the aerial there, which comes down there with a variable tap up and down, and the coupling to the transmitter is also a, a, a can go up and down so that you've got two items there which together can change the actual ratio of that transformer and therefore change the matching impedance capability of this so basically what we do is we turn this knob until we get a good impedance match we're trying to get down to 50 ohms for our transceiver and we've got to have a we've got to have an impedance match there that matches the probably very low impedance of that antenna so that we get a good power transfer. I thought I'd see what sort of VSWR curve I got on an antenna analyzer so I connected uh, the unit to an analyzer, put the whip on and had a look at the VSWR curve and it's it's fairly, uh, a fairly sharp uh, VSWR curve, not as sharp as if we were using a uh, loaded whip but it's nevertheless it's sharp. By the way, the original Miracle Whip details were published in QST in July 2001. It was uh, invented or designed by um, Robert Victor, VA2ERY. I haven't been able to find a copy of that magazine, but uh, I'm sure that if you hunt around uh, long enough on uh, the internet, you may find a copy. So it's QST, July 2001. Now, although it's called a miracle whip, actually, there's nothing miracle about a whip. A whip is a whip, and common sense comes into play. We've got a whip here that is 1.3 metres long, and it could be any whip that uh, we use here. The trick with any antenna is getting maximum power into it. You, get, you need to get maximum power flowing into the antenna. So the miracle is not actually with the antenna or the whip. The miracle, if that's the right word, is actually the matching unit, in this case a variable transformer. And what we need to do is to find a means of getting maximum power into the whip in order to get best performance. And we achieve that by, in this case, a variable transformer. So miracle whip, possibly not, but miracle antenna system? Well, maybe. By the way, the definition of miracle is something that can't be explained by natural events, whereas whiz is a description you use for a person who's very clever. So perhaps whiz whip is the better name. As the unit's fitted with a PL259, I had an adapter to convert the IC705 to an SO239. You do need to put a bit of tape around it to stop it rotating though. However, I'm sure you can come up with a better idea for dealing with that issue. The ultimate test was inside my conservatory on a sofa, and I had a uh, QSO with a German station.
I also found that you can remotely mount the units with a short length of coax cable to put the antenna in a slightly better position. The thing I like about these sort of little units is that you can carry out all sorts of experiments. You don't have to use it as it was originally intended. And so I tried um, uh, several different uh, options which uh, would really leave scope for further experimentation actually. But anyway, I did enjoy sort of adapting the unit so that it was used in a slightly different way to perhaps it was originally intended. I thought I'd try a short dipole. So using a BNC terminal adapter, I created a dipole about three and a half meters long. It was a two meter high makeshift arrangement, supported one end by a bird table and at the other end by my wife's washing line. I got a match below two to one and using reverse beacon, I got reports up to 20 dB above noise. So that was pretty good. With the low impedance matching capability of this device, I thought I'd try a ground mounted dipole. It was a very simple test really, about three meters of wire laid on the ground, little adapter connecting to the transceiver. And uh, the results I got were good in terms of VSWR, but it was a fairly broad VSWR curve. And therefore that indicated to me that possibly it was gonna be lossy, but I need to do more tests on that. Now, ground mounted antennas have had a bit of publicity recently and there's no doubt that they work but uh, i think I need to do a bit more uh, work on that and uh, this was just a sort of side issue i thought i'd try uh, i suspect that if you're going to use a ground mounted um, uh, antenna then uh, you need to get the matching right which seemed okay on this uh, case but uh, maybe you need a bit more power but of course bear in mind that if you're going to ground mount an antenna it's going to tend to be broad banded compared with a high Q antenna because the Q is going to lower quite a bit when you lay it on the ground. But anyway, we'll come back to that at some future video. A lot of the tests I did using reverse beacon because it's uh, very quick to get uh, reports. And uh, well, in the uh, last couple of hours, you can see there, I've got uh, quite, uh, quite a few reports. So uh, there's no doubt about it that the, <laughs> the antenna does work. A quick shout out for Waters and Stanton. We at uh, Waters and Stanton, based at Milford and Keynes, we've got a tremendous range of gear. We've even got the new Yaesu FTDX710 field. New transceiver that's just arrived, it's in stock. Um, difference is, well, it doesn't come with a speaker and it's got a handle on the side. It's basically the same, but it's a different take on it. And uh, it may appeal to those that really don't want the speaker, but would like to carry it about for some little de-expedition. Of course, we'd also do some great part exchange deals. So don't forget, if you want to part exchange something, just pick up the phone, have a chat with one of our guys. We'd be more than happy to help you. So don't forget, Waters and Stanton, Milton Keynes, near the M1. But of course, the WizWhip is not only for transmitting. It also works very good on receive. And if you're a listener or you're a ham radio operator that wants to travel around and have a convenient antenna to plug into some sort of portable receiver, then it works extremely well because it covers through 80 meters to 10 meters. On 80 meters and 40 meters, it works very well, actually. Uh, the only problem you're gonna have is if, if you're in a hotel in the room, you may have a bit of noise, but apart from that, it works extremely well. So don't overlook the fact that the WizWhip is a great receiving uh, antenna. If you've got uh, something like an SDR Play receiver plugged into your laptop, again, a great antenna for receiving. And of course it gives a bit of front end selectivity as well. A couple of adapters you might need. First of all, this little adapter here, this converts BNC to SO239, because most QRP transceivers have got BNC these days. So that enables you to then plug your WizWhip uh, tuner straight into the SO239 socket there. The other thing is if you want to remove the whip off of the WizWhip tuner, then this little device enables you to connect wire to it, either a dipole or an NFED wire. Another useful little device. So what do I think about this antenna? Well, I think miracle is the wrong word. Whiz, yes. Yeah, okay, whiz is acceptable, I suppose. Um, but uh, yeah, it does work. Basically, as I said earlier on in the video, you've got a 1.3 meter whip, and the basic aim is to get as much energy into that whip as you possibly can. And the way you do that 
is by making the feed point or the feed very efficient. And the way that um, the original designer worked on this one is that he created a variable impedance matching network, if you like. And that works very well. And it's quite an unusual way to go. And I feel that um, there's a lot of experimentation that could be carried forward on this principle. I know there has been a little bit done already, but it's an interesting concept. Rather than having a tuned whip with a loading coil at the base, you have an impedance matching network at the base. And it's, it's quite an interesting concept. Um, you can argue, of course, that uh, at the end of the day, both um, systems work. But the, what you cannot deny is the fact that you get something so small that can match a whip over a very wide frequency range. You couldn't do that with a loading coil in that sort of space. Um, it's a QRP as sort of delight, really. Um, an antenna you can fiddle around with, but you can make the antenna longer. You could actually remove the whip um, and have a longer wire, which I have tried actually. Um, you need to get one of those adapters with the two terminals on the top and a BNC uh, at the bottom that uh, fits. But uh, I tried that. Um, you, you can use a, a longer wire. You don't want the wire to go too long because you want to make sure that you've got a fairly low impedance. Um, as regards the counterpoise, well, I didn't actually find any benefit by adding a counterpoise. And I know that one or two people that have done tests on this have found the same thing. And it's almost really the same situation as you find yourself in with an NFED half wave. There's lots of people will tell you you need a counterpoise for an NFED half wave, but in actual practice, you don't. So there we are. Anyway, I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it. And I think the interesting thing about this is that it opens up all sorts of possibilities of doing all sorts of experiments. So if you're into experimenting, or if you're into just general QRP, you may well find this an interesting product. So I hope I've covered it in as much detail as I can. I'm sure I could get more enjoyment and more experimentation out of it if I uh, persisted, but as we're coming into the bad weather now, going outside is not quite so easy. Well, it's, it's not difficult, it's just not so comfortable, is it? Anyway, in the meantime, thank you for supporting this channel. I hope you enjoyed uh, this video and all the other ones. And I always appreciate all your comments and so forth. In the meantime, enjoy your ham radio, you take care. And as usual, I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.